It was back in the roaring 20s when New Jersey first hosted a heavyweight champion. The taller man and the bigger man is almost always going to beat the smaller man and the shorter man. That's usually the case, unless the smaller, shorter man's name is Mike. Mike Tyson. Most competition is governed by feet and inches. From goal line to baseline, from foul line to finish line, the outcome is often the result of these boundaries. But in some sports, the measurements of the human body are thought to be of greater value, such as in boxing, where every portion of the fighter's anatomy is recorded and critiqued. For Mike Tyson, the most scrutinized measurement of all is his height. Is he really 5'11 and a half as reported, or is he shorter? For the press, it's become a very popular question. I'm tall enough to be heavyweight champ of the world. At least 10 times a day, let alone the press asking me how tall I am. People in general saying, you're not as big as I thought you was. The guy is your size doing all that damage. I always thought you were bigger. How big is big? But if the average male height is five foot nine inches, and the average heavyweight champion is six foot one and three quarters inches, then how tall is Mike Tyson? As reported and often contested, Mike Tyson is exactly five feet 11 and one half inches. History has proven that short heavyweights do make legitimate champions. At five foot seven inches, Tommy Burns is the shortest boxer to ever wear the heavyweight crown. A former middleweight champ, the 175-pound Burns successfully defended his heavyweight title 11 times before losing to Jack Johnson. Standing 5'10 and a quarter, Rocky Marciano is heavyweight boxing's most remembered short champion. But short only in stature, for in the ring, heart and determination overshadowed height, or lack of it. Like Tyson, Joe Frazier also measured 5'11 and a half. Known for his left hook and devastating body punches, height was of no object when this heavyweight connected. Tyson's opponents have averaged 6'2 and a half, and only two have stood less than six feet. In boxing, it is often said that the taller fighter has a height advantage, but in the Tyson camp, these fighters have a marked disadvantage. I think you know, it's to my advantage, because most fighters are used to fighting opponents 6'3", 6'2", the average um, heavyweight and I feel that I use it to my advantage because I move my head, I'm very quick, and I'm low to the ground, and it's very difficult to hit me. I crouch low just to make my opponents punch down, because I know where they're gonna punch at, because I'm, I'm down there and I'm looking at them because I'm so low, and I come up, I feel it's to my advantage because they can't see most of my punches coming. I get a lot of leverage for my punches, and it doesn't matter if I punch up or straight or down or around, I have good leverage. His lower body strength provides the leverage necessary to throw powerful punches in an upward movement against taller fighters. As depicted here against the six foot five inch Jose Ribalta. Is it then feasible that the taller opponent is at a disadvantage since there's probably less leverage gained when punching downward at the shorter Tyson? Perhaps another misconstrued measurement is the reach philosophy. The longer the reach, the greater the advantage. It's logical to assume that a longer reach increases a fighter's chances of landing more jabs. But once again, the Tyson camp disagrees. Jabbing is, doesn't have anything to do with the length of your arms or anything. Jabbing is all to do with timing. If you throw your jab at the right time, you could be 5'6", and I'll jab a guy 6'4". This was evident in his last fight against Tony Tucker when Tyson gave up five and a half inches in height and ten and a half inches in reach. Still, he connected with more jabs. I like the fact that I, I'm unique at being one of the shortest heavyweights in the history and having the second shortage reach in history, and still I'm tremendously successful. Perhaps one day a method will exist to calculate a fighter's heart and skill, a day when the advantage or disadvantage will have nothing to do with measures of height or reach. On that day, we may then discover that the sport of boxing is not just a matter of inches. And if I could come back as a guy 6'3", six, 6'4", six, I would never want to change. When I was young, I used to always say, God, I'm just, I'm just a midget. I'm never going to grow. I'm never going to be anything because I'm too short to do any kind of sports, anything. But then, you know, I mean, 
I started believing in myself and things worked out right. So according to Mike Tyson, sometimes the numbers do lie, but take a look at these numbers. The opponents that Mike Tyson has fought who are over six feet, four inches tall as Biggs is tonight. Tillis, it was 6-1. A decision in 10 rounds. Four of the five names that you see, Tucker Smith, Rebalta Green, and Tillis, went the route with Mike Tyson. And tonight, Mike Tyson at 5'11 and a half, that's legitimate, 6'4 and 3 quarters, Tyrell Biggs. The reach, Mike Tyson says, it won't make any difference. Challengers, you know, have just not fared very well in this bastion of Miss Americas and bus tours. George Carpentier came and went back in 1921, and Scott Frank was sent packing by Larry Holmes in 1983. Well, tonight, Tyrell Biggs tries to turn a gold medal into green pastures as he takes on Mike Tyson for the undisputed heavyweight championship. With more on the interesting aspects of this fight, here's Larry Merchant. Good evening. And since what we all want is a good evening, a good fight, I guess I find myself wondering now whether that's part of the reason why so many knowledgeable boxing people and me are making a case for Tyrell Biggs. How much wishful thinking is involved? The case is this. We all know that Mike Tyson is a young whirlwind, but flawed. And we all know that a real disciplined, poised, skilled boxer often can neutralize a whirlwind, a brawler, a brawler. So, if Tyrell Biggs fights his best fight, his most brilliant fight, his bravest fight, well, who knows? Another reason why the case is being made is that it probably can't be made for any other heavyweight out there. But the case itself has a flaw. The flaw is that Tyrell Biggs has never shown the authority of a champion, the ability to rule that square of truth out there, the ability to dominate, to impose his will on opponents. He has never fought the perfect fight with his theoretically perfect boxing skills. What he has done, impressively, is fight under duress. And if there's one thing we do know tonight, he will be under duress again. Even when Tyrell Biggs was up, winning a gold medal at the Olympics in Los Angeles, he was being put down. Put down for his pure amateur style in what was, after all, the biggest amateur tournament in the world. It turned out later that Biggs was in the process of getting higher still for a bigger fall. He was drinking and drugging, recreationally, but it was a poor tent. But when he turned pro, Biggs' crowd-displeasing style became a serious problem. He was booed in his professional debut at Madison Square Garden. Much more serious, however, was his growing drug habit at $1,500 a day. He nearly fell all the way then, until finally he checked himself into a drug clinic. Some people were in there with slit wrists where they actually tried to take their own life. And uh, I said, well, I never tried anything like that when psychologically and mentally that's what I was, you know, that's what I was doing anyway. I was killing myself just, as, if not worse, than somebody slitting their wrist. And this is, these are the things that I came in touch with. And that's when I made my mind, I said, well, I, you know, I can use this. This can, this is what's going to get me back in order. If I can take this, take these tools that they give you and use them the proper way, I can clean myself up. And uh, doing that is a miracle. Ready? His infant son and his girlfriend, the child's mother, provided a human dimension to Big's determination to win his toughest fight. You know, it was kind of an ugly situation, but it was nothing where he was in danger or anything like that. It was just my, my thinking and staying away and, you know, not having them involved in that part of my life. Linda, she's been there. She saw it things that nobody will probably even know about. For her to hang in there with is, is amazing. And as far as Terrell is concerned, I mean, he's, you know, he gives me energy. He's what I live for, you know. He looks up to me um, to feel that love from him, and he depends on me, and, you know, I want to be there for him. I, and I don't, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to be a failure. 
What was thought to be the turnaround in and out of the ring was dramatized in his ninth pro fight when his right collarbone was broken by Jeff Sims, a dangerous journeyman. Biggs responded, though in pain, by dominating the rest of the fight with one hand, his left. But his detractors returned in full voice after his unimpressive victory over Quick Tillis. And when he decked Ronaldo Snipes but couldn't finish him, that was another mark against him. And his own handlers were suspicious of a drug relapse after a car accident, but he was clean. Then a flat-footed big slugged it out with David Bay and suffered a terrible eye cut that nearly lost the fight and cost him a shot at Mike Tyson. But as with his other problems and setbacks, Biggs rallied. He stopped Bay dramatically just seconds before the referee was prepared to stop the fight. If it hasn't been one thing, it's been two or three for Terrell Biggs. Cynics believe Biggs' managers took the Tyson fight prematurely with only 15 pro fights, none against a top contender, before something else happened to him. They claim that Biggs' record of overcoming adversity will carry over to Tyson, that his strength of body is now matched by his strength of character and maturity. I believe that what I've been through and as good as I am, I know that I, I know how good I am. And for me to have been criticized and the whole shot, I mean, you know, I owe it to myself to go out there and beat Michael Tyson like I am his dad. It's, he's made for me, Ty's son. I, I owe it to myself to go out there and beat this fella and be called the new undisputed heavyweight champion in the world. Well, tonight is when Tyro Biggs gets a chance to turn those words into actions. And he, of course, will be the first man out of his locker room and into the ring. And this crowd, I tell you, is really alive here. Muhammad Ali has just been introduced. And Ali is out there, Ray, leading cheers. Vintage Muhammad Ali. That's all reminiscent for Muhammad Ali. He's a great, great champion. And, of course, what a lot of people are hoping is that uh, Tyrell Biggs can emulate Muhammad Ali and being able to defuse the big man. This is the uh, Ali did it to Liston, he did it to Foreman, he did it to Fraser. Can Tyrell Biggs do that? And the Olympic theme being played, and you saw that graphic a moment ago that seven champions, Olympic gold medalists, have gone on to be heavyweight champions. Of course, four of those seven did not win Olympic heavyweight titles. Muhammad Ali, Floyd Patterson, and both the Spinks brothers. And of course, one thing that Tyrell Biggs is going to have to think about, at least somewhere in the back of his mind, is that serious cut that he suffered against David Bay. And you can see, over the left eye, took 30-some stitches to close that. And there, on the right of your screen, is the scar tissue that was left from that. I'll say this, however. If he gets hit with right hands there, it isn't the cut he's going to have to worry about. <laughs> That's a, that is a valid point. You know, we talked about the fact that Larry alluded to it, that he has been criticized in several of his most recent fights, and yet people are really giving him a legitimate chance just to kind of go back and tell you a little bit. When he fought Rod Smith, that was the first fight he had after he broke his collarbone against Sims. He said that he was a little bit tentative, and he didn't really use the right hand in that fight. Then he fought Purcell Davis. That's the gentleman that I mentioned at 254 pounds who really offered no resistance, and he said that his bombs were more dud than they were dynamite. Biggs has been trying to make the transition from an amateur to a professional, to being more aggressive. And in so doing, he's been catching punches. So the question is whether he can find out who he, is, who he is and fight the fight who he is. And that best fight might be fighting as an amateur, sticking and moving floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. And he also came in with a jacket reminiscent of my partner here, Sugar Ray Leonard, something new in the sport of boxing. Speaking of Sugar Ray Leonard, we have always tried to give you a little bit of an insight, just things to look for in every fight as we go along on this HBO, particularly through the heavyweight series, and in fact, in every fight. And right now, let's take a look at Ray Leonard's tip of the night. What to look for from each of these men tonight, Ray? Well, there should be a classic confrontation, Barry, with the boxer against the puncher. Well, actually, Tyson is the puncher who beat the aggressor, but he must be patient 
because he has a tendency with his crouching style to be susceptible to the uppercut. Here gets Tony Tucker, there, the uppercut land, and that's the punch that Biggs has been working on in the gym. Another a mistake that Tyson makes, he tries to load up with one punch. That would not work against a guy like Biggs, who gives you a lot, a lot of angles, good upper body movement. And here against Ronaldo Snipes, the good body movement. And watch this combination here, Barry. On and over, to raise the chin, and then to follow up with a clean right hand. I've been very impressed with this particular combination. A beautiful combination thrown by uh, Biggs. Biggs can't afford to stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Here against David Bay, he was prone to be hit with combinations and also prone to cuts. That right hand by David Bay cut him. So he must give lateral positions and angles to be effective against Mike Tyson. Two things, though, that he didn't do, and just to go back to those little snatches that you saw against Ronaldo Snipes, as you saw, he had him down to the fourth round, but he didn't follow up. Snipes was done, and Biggs couldn't put him away. And then against David Bay, he hit him consistently, but until he was cut, he really didn't go after David Bay. For both fighters, it's not, I don't think it's going to be necessarily one punch, although Tyson is an exception, but it's going to be combinations to be effective. And I go back to the old thing of, can you make Pete Rose into Babe Ruth? Can you make this guy into a banger? It depends on the size of the bet. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of that, uh, the odds uh, in my last call to Las Vegas turned out to be about seven and a half to one in favor of Tyson, down from around 11 to one earlier in the week. Tyson is a slight favorite to stop the fight, end it before the end of the sixth round. And a little bit of a waiting game going on now, and it's really quieted the crowd, too. The crowd was right into this fight, right from the very beginning. It is a capacity crowd of about 12,000. You can see many of them, everybody on their feet here. Right now, it's kind of a waiting game, and that is Mike Tyson making, t making Tyrell Biggs wait and both fighters making the crowd wait, and they're starting to get the first glimpse now of Mike Tyson, and Tyson, we understand, is going to run into the ring. And here comes Mike Tyson now, and as usual, he is all business, draped in the three belts that he now owns. Well, as, as Mills Lane, the, the referee from Nevada says, Mike Tyson surely looks like he's saying, let's get it on. He was telling us the other day that there's an expression on the streets where he was raised that say, you got to bring it to get it. And that's exactly his philosophy. It means that you can't win at the tables with your hands in your pockets. And you can't win in here unless you take some shots, take some risks. You know, he quotes Joe Frazier, actually, as he comes into the ring when people criticize his height, that he's too small, and he says Frazier believed he was big enough to get the job done, and that's all that counts. Mike Tyson, of course, 31-0, 27 knockouts. Until he won the title, actually, he hadn't fought any anybody more impressive than Biggs has fought to this point. Since that time, Tyson has fought a better class of fighter than Biggs has. And the crowd, again, still very much into this. Five years difference, Mike Tyson is younger than Biggs, even though he's had 31 fights to Biggs 15. Yeah, Barry, and uh, Tyson, interestingly, came in a few pounds less than he has recently. Obviously, he wants to be able to keep up with the guy who's the boxer. And Biggs came in, bulked up by a few pounds. Obviously, he wants to be strong for Tyson. What it means is they're both ready. And here is our punch stat, our statistical profile of the fighters. Tyson's last fight against Tucker. You see how many punches he threw. He throws fewer punches than Biggs, uh, but, of course, he throws more meaningful ones. Against Tillis, uh, Tyson's most difficult fight before he became champion, he threw a few fewer punches than Biggs did and landed fewer, but Tyson is a lot different fighter now than he was then. And in the jabs, as you might suspect, Biggs throws more of them than Tyson, but Tyson showed in his last fight against Tucker that he can use the jab effectively. And the rules tonight will come under the IBF jurisdiction. They will rotate that, incidentally, in a case where there is 
an undisputed champion. Ten point must system, three judges score the fight. There will not be a standing eight count. No surprises here. The fighter can be saved by the bell only in the last round, and the three knockdown rule has been waived. Right now, we'll go up to the ring announcer, Michael Buffer, for the pre-fight introductions. Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please, before we get started. Recently, a great friend of boxing passed away. At this time, in a tribute to one of sports and boxing's finest journalists, would everyone please rise for silence as timekeeper Roosevelt Gilbert tolls the final count of ten for the late Dick Young. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the featured bout of the evening. It's a presentation of Don King Productions and the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino, along with Budweiser. This bout is sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board Commissioner Larry Hazard. Deputy Commissioners Nick D. Balistrieri and Lawrence Wallace. The chairman is Jerry Gormley. Representing the International Boxing Federation is its president, Robert W. Lee. The championship committee chairman is here, Bill Brennan. Representing the World Boxing Association, Dr. Keith Arthur and Dr. Elias Cordova. Here for the World Boxing Council is James J. Binns, Esquire. The three judges doing all the scoring tonight are Al Walensky, John Stewart, and Frank D. Brunette. The timekeeper, Roosevelt Gilbert, counting for the knockdown seconds, Rudy Battle. Chief ringside physician, Dr. Frank B. Doggett. Also in attendance, Dr. Stanley Eden and Dr. Paul Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble from the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino by way of Convention Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey. 15 rounds for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. The referee for this bout is Tony Orlando. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He's wearing the white trunks and weighs 228 and three quarter pounds. He's from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This Olympic gold medal champion has 15 consecutive victories, 10 by knockout. Introducing the number one challenger in the world, Tyrell B. Fighting out of the red corner, wearing the solid black trunks. He weighs 216 pounds. From Catskill, New York, 27 of his 31 unblemished victories are by knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, the undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson. Gentlemen, you received your instructions prior to coming to the ring. Therefore, I expect a good, clean bout. Do you have any questions? Touch gloves, back to your corner. Good luck. Barry and Ray, I wouldn't be surprised if this fight lasted a minute or an hour. I feel exactly <laughs> the same way. It's one of those fights you really don't know. I, I believe in the opinions of many of the people who feel that Tyrell Biggs can win the fight. I don't happen to be of that school, but... You just don't know. Expect Tyson to jump right on Tyrell Biggs. Three questions that Mike Tyson really has to answer. Can he cope with a clever boxer? Can he survive a heavy puncher? And can he persevere when he's hurt? You notice right from the start, Tyson is applying the pressure. Trying to slow his man down. I'm seeing more jazz from Mike Tyson than I've seen in the past. I see a lot of movement on the part of uh, Tyrell Biggs. Good lateral movement. Those hands should be up a little higher because, again, the hand speed of Mike Tyson is very good. 
You have said that Biggs has to go side to side to win the fight, right? Go side to side, give your man angles, throw the jab like he's doing now, not to let Tyson set up. Uh, Tyson also said that he has found a pattern in Tyrell Biggs that he feints to the right before the punch actually is thrown. Well, whatever he does, the fact that Tyson has to set up to get that kind of leverage. See, a good snapping jab is very effective. Whether or not Biggs can keep this up is yet to be seen. It's not time to be pretty in here. It's just time to frustrate this man. And that's what they want from, Ty from uh, Biggs. Good, consistent jab. And along the lines of patterns, Biggs feels that Tyson actually bobs in a pattern four times, and then he comes up with his head. See, wait, now here, you saw how Tyson walks in with that crouching style to deliver a shot. He's trying for the head. Now we see him head, head hunting from Mike Tyson. He can't get into that. That was a good shot by Tyson. Get off the ropes, tie your man up. That's the way. Get him back into the center ring. Use the jab again. And come with that right hand. That was a quick little overhand right by Tyrell Biggs. Biggs now is talking to Tyson. Again, Barry, he's trying to frustrate him. But I don't like his hands down that low. I don't like Biggs' hands down so low. Because Tyson throws those looping right hands and left hooks. Give him up, Mike. Give him up. Body shot by Tyson. Teofilo Stevenson, and I admit it was five years ago, but he really bothered there me. There is the hook, again, because his hands are down. He's moving right, but he keeps his hands down too low. Tyson has very quick hands for a big man. Stevenson beat Biggs Boys, by going go, to the body. Go, Broke three go. ribs, as a matter of fact. A lot of water under the bridge since then. They're going to have to fix Tyson's equipment here in just a moment, as it has come loose. Biggs is starting to become a stationary target, which is wrong. Right hand by Bad Tyson. A little bit of blood inside the mouth of Tyrell Biggs. I don't know if Biggs can fight a perfect fight, but he thought about as perfect a round as he could have hoped for to start this fight. see our punch stat which tells you that Tyson is not effective with the jab and of course Tyrell Biggs is very effective with it. Okay. And as Punchstat showed or confirmed, that was a very good round using the left hand as well as he can. That is exactly what Biggs must do to stay in this fight. Can Tyson neutralize the jab? You see, Biggs is doing great the first two minutes of the first round, keeping that jab consistent, moving lateral, giving angles. But then the last maybe 45 seconds of the round, Barry, he stopped, became stationary target. The hands again, which I think is a, a, a major mistake because of Tyson's hand speed. And Tyson throws his punch, he loops his right hand, he loops his hook, and uh, Biggs could be asked for a few problems. And the thing that strikes me, actually, is Biggs did have a round and did fight according to his fight plan, but he still took some strong shots from Tyson. You see, now Biggs again are starting to stand there and exchange toe-to-toe, -to -toe, like I said earlier. You can't do that. Tyson's punches come so fast with so much velocity behind him. It's devastating. Biggs has shown a tendency, actually, throughout his career, and especially later in his career, most recently, to get in there occasionally and want to slug it out when he's been stunned. And that could be suicide. And the way that Biggs is moving to his right, that's wrong because of the hook of Mike Tyson. He'll run right to the left hook. Uh, 
two hands, two hands, punch out. Let him go, let him go. Let him go, let him go, let him go. What I was Step expecting on, from Vix, and in fact, they, they hold told hold me this, break. that he's been prepared on, for working this in the gym, break, was the uppercut, the jab, Let's to go in. through go. Tyson's defense. I have not seen that yet. And the game plan was for Biggs rather to move to his left. Now he's been moving to his right, and as you said, he's been getting himself in a little trouble when he does so. Tyson is driven some tremendous shots to the body. And uh, that's going to help bring those hands down even lower. Remember, Stevenson broke three ribs of Tyrell Biggs. I'm looking for a left hook, Barry. I really am because of the, look at the right hand of uh, Tyrell Biggs. That's the uppercut, but you got to come right, back with the right up hand. Up the uppercut raises the chin of a guy who crouches in, and the right hand does the most damage. There was a big right hand, best punch of the fight. That was the left hook, Barry. That was the left hook I was talking about. Now, if Big should make it back to his corner, I'm sure Georgie Bennett will say, keep those hands high. Right, left. I'll get it right. <laughs> right, left. <Beth. laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the right hand's down, a big, the left hook has been scoring. And it rocked Big. As Michael Tyson said before this fight, everybody has a plan. Until they're hit. Oh, you get a little bit more coming in, a little bit more jab. You start that run real good, then you slow down with the jab. You hurt him with that hook. You understand me? I want to see, I want to see the five-one now. Seven, seven coming in. Look at five-one, five-five-one. You understand me? Take a little spring back, or put a little twist in there. Take a little sip. And here is Tyson's most effective punch. Biggs has been on his uh, flat-footed more in this round than he was in the first round got nailed with the left hook. He has shown in the past that he takes a good punch. You don't want to take too many from Tyson. But now look, this guy will slow down. Second shot. Just, it wasn't a stomp for another round. Second shot. You understand? Come on, Tyson. You can't do much more than you So Kevin Rooney wants Mike Tyson to jab a little bit more. And Big starts the third round backing up a little bit. Good stiff jab by Mike Tyson. Tyson will constantly apply pressure to Biggs. Keep working his body and working a jab like Kevin Rooney stated. People don't realize this. I learned this from Andrew Dundee. It's not about how long your jab is. The fact that if you have a jab, use it. That offsets someone else's jab. And the left hook. The hook's going to land all night, Barry, because his right hand is down. Let me show you what Tyson does when he delivers that left hook. He takes one, two steps in, dips, and, and puts his whole body, all his weight behind the punch. A lot of leverage. One, two. You see it. Steps in. So you have to time it. You have to time his movement. One, two. Again, same thing. One, two. And he throws it. That was a little short left hand that did get in. Body shot with a left hand. I break. And, this and now the cut over the left eye, and it's pretty bad. It's the same eye, the same cut. And another big left hand, and Biggs is hurt. Now he gets out of there. A lot of blood from the left eye of Tyrell Biggs. That's the same thing, thing probably happened with uh, hold it, hold it, hold it. David Bates. They're in a toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It's a terrible mistake. That's something you pointed out before the fight. And now it's Tyson just hammering him. That's a nasty cut. It's, it's, the blood is seeping to the eye. This requires a lot of work in the corner of Tyrell Biggs to stop that bleeding. The cut is right above the eye. It's exactly in the same place as the last one. Biggs, this, I don't know what happened. All that gym work has gone down the drain because he's not boxing, he's not using his tools. 
He's trying to outmuscle Mike Tyson, which is not his fight plan. And there's a huge left hand. They may stop it. That's a nasty cut. And I don't think I can tell you what a finisher Mike Tyson is. The pressure, the relentless pressure of Tyson he takes its toll. It's a big round. Hold it there, hold it there. Hey, don't put it in the end. There you see that cut against Ty and that he absorbed against Tyrell against David Bay and here it is right now being worked on. That was a 32 stitch gash that he suffered from Bay. Now let's see if we can catch it as it happens. That's the punch that apparently sliced Bay open. Excuse me, Tyrell. Bigs open. It's the same right hand, Larry, that was thrown by David Bay. Let's remember that Biggs has fought his best when he's been in trouble. But I think it's fair to say that he's not in there against David Bay tonight. Right hand body shot and the left hand behind it by Tyson. Mike Tyson is not just loaded with one punch. He's trying to put his punches together. He's trying to put together combinations. A mistake he made with Tony Tucker. Tyson Ray, to me, seems to be a little bit more patient tonight. Yes, he, in fact, he is a little more composed, uh, picking his shots. But again, I don't, know, I don't know why they don't pick it up in Big's corner, the way Tyson steps in and leaves his chin so vulnerable. The way I see it now, Mike Tyson has made big fight his fight. So far, the cut has not been any worse. And remember, it was a pretty good job done by Ace Parada, his cut man, in the fight with David Bay. But again, Tyson just putting all the pressure on him, having it his way. Didn't seem like Mike was a good short uppercut by uh, Mike Tyson. A little more up by the movement from uh, Tyrell Biggs now. Start to throw some uppercuts. He took a big left hand there. And another. The cut is reopened again. Right. Step back. One go, one go. Step back, please. Step back. All right, Drake, step back. No punches, no punches. No punch. Step them back. Watch your head, Mike. Watch your head, okay? How does it happen, Ray, that a fighter like Biggs, in this case tonight, will go into a fight with a game plan, and almost from the opening bell, he'll just let that game plan go away? It's all concentration. you got to stick to something that's working for you. And what I see in Tyson, Tyson sticks to his game plan. He works the body with that right hand. He drills a hard right hand to the body and comes up with a good left hook. But Biggs is doing almost everything exactly the opposite of what he said he was going to do. Huge left hand there by Tyson. And a combination by Tyson, a left and a right behind him. Getting to be a mismatch. Right now, Tyson looks like he's rolling in like the tide from the Atlantic Ocean a few steps from Convention Hall.